Hello and welcome. My name is Jamila Michener and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Government at Cornell. And I'm welcoming you to our second installment of a series that we call Democracy 2020. And it's organized by the American Democracy Collaborative. Uh, now more than ever, the intellectual work of the American Democracy Collaborative is pivotal, right? Um, this is a group of political scientists, some of us who study the United States, others of us who don't study the United States, who study the many other impar parts of the world that are also really important and valuable to study. Uh, but we've come together with an eye towards threats to democracy and its preservation and an eye towards learning from one another to understand those topics better. So today we're gonna, under, we're gonna examine a question that's a key part of that, which is can the United States hold free and fair elections this fall? I think that's a really hard question and I'm glad that we have some really brilliant people here today to think about it with us. You can read more about the American De Democracy Collaborative at, and this is gonna be really insightful, americandemocracycollaborative.org. <laughs> I love it when websites are intuitive. Uh, and we'll be posting on the website more information about upcoming events. We'll have our next event will be titled Already Authoritarian, Policing, the Use of Force and Democracy. And we'll have uh, Veshla Weaver, the one and only, as well as Sabrina Karim from here at Cornell and a third surprise panelist. So check the website so that you can figure out the surprise. It's like my kids, what's in the cereal box? Um, okay, we'll also announce the date and time of that webinar soon. So again, check the website. Uh, so we're really appreciative to Cornell uh, for making this possible, particularly the Ionaudi Center. Uh, and now I get to turn things over to my colleague, David Bateman, who's going to do the actual hard work by being our moderator today. Uh, David is also an associate professor in the Department of Government. Uh, he's a pretty incredible colleague to have, one of my favorite people. He studies American political development, democrati democratization, disenfranchisement, and a bunch of other really important things that I can't do justice to in 10 seconds. So find his work and read it. And um, before I turn it over to David, the last thing I'll say is, if you are struck by anything you hear here, don't forget to tweet. We'll be tweeting at hashtag democracy2020. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jamila. And thank you to our, to our panelists for joining us to discuss whether the United States can hold free and fair elections this fall. We have four, over 400 registrations. So we know that a lot of us are intensely concerned with this question. There were already reasons to be concerned with the state of American elections before the pandemic. The president, for example, has repeatedly shown an unwillingness to positively affirm that he will accept the results of the election, refusing yet again just last week to do so. Some of the problems, however, predate the president. We have a very fragmented electoral system in this country, vulnerable in a variety of ways to both malfeasance as well as simple mistakes. We have growing levels of distrust in the legitimacy of the system and in the commitment of public officials to making sure that all citizens can cast a vote and have it counted and the ongoing pandemic is only gonna complicate matters further. Behind these specific concerns about elections, however, is a more general worry about democratic backsliding. While these worries are propelled in large part by the president's behavior on a variety of fronts, they're not entirely new and they are certainly not uniquely American. Thinking of how these patterns relate to others seen around the world is more important today than ever. And I can't think of three people I would rather hear from on these issues than the panelists we have with us today. Amel Ahmed is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her work focuses on comparative democratization, and especially in the origins of electoral institutions and their unintended consequences for electoral reform. Themes she's developed in her fabulous book, Democracy and the Politics of Electoral System Choice. There's no one who's better situated to draw from historical and comparative experiences to help us understand American elections today. Jacob Grumbach is an Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Washington and a faculty associate with the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies. His research focuses broadly on the political economy of the United States, with an emphasis on public policy, racial and economic inequality, and American federalism. He's been doing a lot of work on the topic of mail-in voting, which is going to play an even greater role in the fall elections than it has in previous years. We're very excited to hear about that. And last, but certainly not least, 
Richard Hassan is Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of California, Irvine. Hassan is a nationally recognized expert in election law and campaign finance regulation. He's the author of numerous books, all of which have been eye-opening and highly compelling, from which I've personally learned, learned an enormous amount. His newest book, Election Meltdown, Dirty Tricks, Distrust, and the Threat to American Democracy, is out just recently with Yale University Press, and will no doubt be of great interest to our audience. So we're going to start off with the, the conversation, and I hope that this will be a conversation, with a few questions to our panelists. And just to get the ball rolling and just to get everybody in the right mindset, we want to start off with asking the question, what causes you the most anxiety about the prospect of holding free, fair, and secure elections this fall? And I'd like to start off with Amel, and then we'll go to Jake, and then to Richard. Amel. Thank you, David. Um, the question of what causes me the most anxiety took uh, quite a while to, to settle on a single answer, and I don't think there is a single answer. Um, but I think certainly holding elections in the context of a pandemic is what is alarming most people, uh, both technically and politically. I think there's no reason to think that we will handle elections under a pandemic better than we've handled the actual pandemic, which is to say, I think we should expect that there are going to be lots of complications. And I think there will be both first order complications of how do we implement the strategies that we, that we recommend? How do we implement those? And then the consequences of implementing those new strategies. So the first order challenge is how do we hold these elections safely? Um, and there have been great proposals for uh, increasing mail-in voting and early voting and advanced voting. And I think there are, there's evidence that states are moving in this direction. But that really introduces the second order problem, which is that we're moving very quickly. And most states that have adopted mail-in voting, for example, take several years to do that. Uh, when you're moving as quickly as we are trying to identify venues, um, new venues to, with, with larger capacities, for example, every single one of these moves, uh, even though they're welcome, um, every single one of these moves introduces complications and opportunities for error. And I think that is the, the real question. Uh, one thing I wanted to address though in the framing of the question is what is, what are the impediments to free and fair elections? And I wanted to distinguish between what will really, we can all expect will be a very messy electoral process. And I'd say election administration on its best day is messy and complicated and introduces all sorts of irregularities, some of which we hear about, some of which we do not. But I think it's going to be very important distinguishing between irregularities um, and events that systematically bias outcomes. And in understanding free and fair elections, I think irregularities we can absorb, errors we can absorb, even consequential errors. If you, you know, think back to the 2000 election, those were some very consequential errors. Those we can absorb. What we really need to pay attention to are the things that would produce a systematic bias in one direction or another and might lead one party or another to reject the outcomes. Yeah, I'll follow Amel's great, uh, great answer there. So uh, I think Amel described pretty well the, so we saw in the Wisconsin primary this year, turnout of about 15 percentage points or something like that, the shutdown of many in-person voting polling places during the pandemic, the refusal to expand absentee and mail voting. Um, and that I think is uh, a first order concern is uh, extreme danger of COVID and states not moving to vote by mail or not fully trying to implement vote by mail. We know not just the sort of uh, de jure policy matters, but the full state administration and county election administrators all the way down need to really want to implement it in an effective way. That's a first order problem. But really for me, I'd say it's the, my biggest concern is the interaction of two sort of forces. Uh, one is the long-term, mostly Republican party, but especially Donald Trump based delegitimization of essentially voting as a mechanism for affecting democratic outcomes in general. And then interacting that with the rise of sort of really paramilitary and somewhat authoritarian uh, policing and military uh, interventions against protests and uh, civil assembly and things like that. I think that interaction is is uh, quite frightening. Um, the prospect, this is not like, if you remember the sort of Fox News conspiracy during the Obama administration of the new Black Panthers going to polling places, that was uh, extremely far-fetched and, and state and local police forces would certainly not allow for that. Um, 
uh, but uh, a sort of what we've seen in the Michigan legislature in Oregon with uh, paramilitary groups occupying state legislatures and shutting down legislative sessions, something like that combined with the long-term uh, delegitimization of elections. Yeah, so, yeah, so I would, um, I think, agree with both uh, Jake and ML generally. Let me just paint a picture of a particular nightmare scenario that I'm worried about, and it kind of brings together the um, concerns that I had before the election, uh, before the b before the election season started, uh, when my my book came out the day of the uh, uh, Iowa caucuses, which uh, really helped to <laughs> solidify the idea that we might be facing an election meltdown, and then with the rise of COVID, um, and so so here here's my nightmare scenario. Uh, Donald Trump has made uh, so many comments uh, against mail-in balloting uh, that we are starting to see Republicans shift to uh, more voting in person. I think this is actually going to depress Republican turnout because some people are not going to feel comfortable voting in person or there are going to be long lines. But we're starting to see where we, where we had not seen a real partisan difference in the use of mail-in balloting across parties. We now do see that. Uh, so it's quite possible that um, if it's a close election, uh, that in a swing state like Pennsylvania or Michigan, Donald Trump is ahead on election night, um, thanks to the counting of ballots that are in person. Uh, Trump declares victory. Uh, it's because of poor election administration in places like Detroit and in uh, Philadelphia, and because of the flood of absentee ballots that we're not prepared for and that there has not been adequate funding for. It's going to take a week or more before those ballots can be fully counted. Donald Trump claims victory and continues to make claims as he made as recently as this morning that voting by mail is rigged. Uh, he's making these claims without uh, any evidence to support them. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, Trump and his uh, uh, closest advisors regularly vote by mail and they're trying to draw distinctions between vote by mail and absentee ballots that make no uh, 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 distinction between these two. But it's quite possible uh, that we could see Trump claiming victory uh, and then a week or uh, two weeks later, Biden declared the winner. Uh, this is not accepted as legitimate and we have a kind of breakdown of um, our normal election processes. It might even include uh, competing slates of electors being sent to um, Congress for counting. Remember that uh, these states have Republican legislatures and the Republican legislature might purport whether it has the authority or not to come up with a, a, a different slate of electors. Uh, it also might happen that uh, the courts in Pennsylvania or Michigan decide they need to extend the polling times or something because of either uh, the virus or some kind of cyber attack or just uh, uh, problems with how the election is run. And this is claimed to be illegitimate, uh, leading to the creation of this alternative slate of electors, where it goes to Congress or to the Supreme Court or both, where there is uh, a partisan divide over these questions. Uh, and uh, with, as Jake mentioned, um, uh, the potential for uh, federal troops in different cities, uh, it just creates a very volatile mix. And uh, it makes me very concerned about how things might look if it, if it is a close election. And I'll just end with that point. I keep saying if it is a close election, I do think that the margin really matters here and that if uh, we don't have a close election and uh, say you have a Biden or Trump winning a clear majority in the Electoral College without taking a look at um, these pivotal uh, states that have their problems, then I think we will focus on their problems as academics, but uh, it won't be the subject of uh, social unrest and, 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 and uh, pop, uh, you know, populist uh, uprisings, potentially. So those are that's a, quite a nightmarish scenario, Bob, but I think one that is not uh, far-fetched at all. I'd like to follow up on a few of the points that each of you has raised, and I'd like to hear your responses to each other. And perhaps uh, a good way of doing so would be to um, connect it with the points that Amel was making and uh, that Jake was making about mail-in voting. So I guess my first follow-up question would be to Jake, and that would just be, well, what should we do about mail-in voting now to prepare for the types of dangers that Amel recognized and that Rick has recognized and put on the table? Yeah, so uh, first off, in a pandemic, uh, you know, voting by mail is absolutely crucial. Um, there's also historically, essentially, infinitesimally small evidence of mail voting fraud, despite what uh, you hear increasingly from sort of uh, certain political elites. 
Um, and then I just want to uh, emphasize Rick's point about the, the delay in the counting of ballots with mail-in voting. So we're so used to traditionally staying up on the Tuesday in November election night on the West Coast. Uh, you get, you know, you may be able to do it before the kids go to bed. On the East Coast, people stay up a little late and have a, you know, little election night party. With mail-in voting, we may have to be prepared for a longer stretch of days counting this, and that shouldn't uh, mean a less legitimate election result. So that's uh, certainly a concern. But overall, uh, the increasing partisanship at the elite level of uh, mail-in voting is really concerning given, so poll, poll after poll over the years have shown that, uh, you know, both parties, super majorities of both parties' bases in the electorate enjoy vote by mail and uh, typically want to expand access to mail-in ballots via no-fault absentee or full all-mail voting elections. Um, my research and a couple of other uh, papers that have come out quickly have shown that uh, both uh, vote by mail tends to increase turnout uh, when it's in, in particular in Colorado and to some extent Washington state where uh, the election administrations have, have really put automatic voter registration plus uh, uh, automatic uh, mailing of ballots to all individuals with drop boxes around cities and towns and post offices and college campuses, you've seen a greater increase in turnout. And this increase in turnout has been among really all demographic groups and partisan groups in society. Um, and it's really, a, 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 it doesn't, seem to swing election outcomes in a partisan direction, but it does uh, have appeal for both people that are traditionally disenfranchised, low income, uh, uh, black and Latino people, uh, young people, students, as well as older people who have been using absentee ballots uh, for longer periods of time. So Amela Rick, would you like to jump in on this? Rick, you're on, you need to unmute, sorry. Sorry, it wouldn't be a Zoom seminar without someone forgetting to unmute. So I'm glad I got that out of the way. Um, uh, you know, when you look at mail-in balloting across the United States, it's just um, really a wide variety of levels of competence. Let's just to just take a, a, a number that I found astounding. In 2016, in the Georgia primary, the presidential primary election, 36,000 people voted uh, by mail. And in uh, the 2020 uh, election, it was 1.2 million voters who requested absentee ballots. That kind of scale, it's not something that's easy to ramp up. Um, and, you know, we're now, I think, four weeks since the New York primary, and they're still counting ballots. Uh, New York is particularly Byzantine and unfair in how it runs its elections. I like to say that if New York were a Republican state, people would be protesting voter suppression in the streets, um, but they pay a lot less attention to it uh, because it's a democratic state. Uh, there's a wide variety of competencies, and uh, uh, we, we're running an election in 10,500 different jurisdictions. There are going to be problems. Uh, there are going to be problems, uh, and you know, for as much as Trump's talking about fraud, and I'm happy to um, uh, you know, talk about the fraud issue, which I know is on a lot of people's minds, my bigger concern about absentee ballots is how many people are going to be disenfranchised. We're seeing rates of, uh, you know, not like the 1% that we often see, but 5, 10, even 20% in some places of ballots being tossed because of people making errors in how they are um, filling out their ballots, um, forgetting to sign them, or it's not even an error. Their signature is found to mis be mismatched. And how is, you know, who's going to be trained to be checking the signatures in places where they don't normally do this, where the rate of absentee ballots is going to go from 3% to 40%. So there's a lot of a potential for disenfranchisement. If it really is a very close election, it's going to be you know, trench warfare fighting over every ballot, and it's going to be very ugly. And part of that is a, a problem of partisanship. Pro part of that is a problem of competence uh, and uh, resources. Congress has only allocated $400 million for the additional expenses that are going to come up nationwide, not only for absentee balloting, but for in-person voting in a safe way. And, uh, you know, the estimates are $2 billion or more are going to be needed. It's not clear if this final that supposedly final coronavirus bill that's supposed to come out of Congress at the end of this month is going to include additional funding. But whether that funding comes or not, the absentee ballot requests are coming, the absentee ballots are coming, there are going to be mistakes and there's going to be disenfranchisement because of the lack of preparation.
So David, I wanted to just jump in on this point because we've been very focused on mail-in balloting and I think it makes sense and it's gotten a lot of attention recently. But there's also early voting, which we haven't talked about very much. And there is uh, more capacity, I think, to expand early voting in a lot of these states. And early voting has some uh, several advantages. A lot of the issues that have been brought up with mail-in balloting, um, this, uh, votes not being counted or coming in too late uh, can be resolved with early voting, and especially considering that um, mail-in balloting is not really a, a reliable method for those who have, you know, low-income individuals who have unstable residences, for younger voters who, who move around a lot. So I think expanding early voting is another strategy that we really, in, in 2016, I believe early voting accounted for half of all of advanced voting. Uh, so I think there is room to expand there and, and avoid potentially some of these areas. Um, but I wanted to go back again to the question of democratic legitimacy, because it is very easy to get lost in the weeds of this. And I think um, it's important for everyone to manage the rhetoric around what what constitutes an actual challenge for democratic legitimacy versus uh, evidence of state failure or, or a failure of capacity. And I think, you know, one way to look at elections is that this is a scientific means of ascertaining the popular will. This is a scientific means of figuring out exactly who the people want. Another way to look at it is that it's a means of forming government. Um, and I think it's both, of course, but I think one points you towards the process and one points you towards the outcome. And understanding or what, determining whether or not this is a defensible, legitimate democratic outcome is what I really keep going back to. Because at the end of the day, um, it's not so much the, the technical results of the election, but our democracy resides within our willingness to accept those results. Um, and so my, my uh, thinking always goes towards the outcome. Um, perhaps even more so than the process. I like that conceptualization. I mean, we, we do need to think, so this panel is mostly about this sort of electoral democracy dimension, uh, uh, sort of determining how healthy American democracy is, but thinking about, you know, liberalism, egalitarianism, and these other forms of, and deliberation and participation as other key forms that, you know, are somewhat associated with elections. Um, and I, I just want to come back to the long-term underinvestment in election infrastructure in the U.S. Um, part of this is the role of uh, the institutions of American federalism, where states constitutionally am administer election have very different incentives for how to determine the size of the electorate. Uh, uh, states of the former Confederacy have a long and storied history of uh, of determining of a sort of racial caste system in elections that, uh, you know, our, our moderator has, uh, has written about uh, really powerfully. Um, but this, this is, a, is a massive deal. So the CARES Act passed by Congress unsigned provided, uh, sort of Rick mentioned, uh, provided emergency funding to administer elections, to move to mail voting, to expand early voting, to uh, train additional, like get PPE for election administrators and poll workers these sorts of things. As of Ju early June, seven states still hadn't requested that funding. And it reminded me of states' refusal to expand Medicaid um, under the Affordable Care Act. Free money from the federal government to expand Medicaid. You know, local hospital lobbies wanted it, patients wanted it, both Democratic and Republican voters seem to have wanted it. Um, and states still have, some Republican states have still refused that. This is a, a really, I think, a radically new moment in American federalism where states administer elections for all levels, for all races of uh, government and can really affect now with a coordinated Republican party nationally, um, you get some coordination from the Trump administration has actually had uh, tried to push state election administrators to do uh, new mechanisms of voter suppression. And this, uh, the sort of federal institutions that divide authority between the state and the national government in which states administer elections is actually really coming to a head now, I think. I, I would just add to that. Um, I agree with those points, uh, but the other pressure here is uh, litigation. Uh, we are seeing uh, the, uh, already in 2018, uh, in statistics that I've compiled in election meltdown, uh, 2018 was the uh, most litigious uh, uh, election season 
at least since 1996 and probably ever. And uh, there's no question in my mind that 2020 is going to outpace that. Uh, my colleague Justin Levitt over at the Election Law Blog has been keeping track of COVID-related election lawsuits. And I think as of yesterday, he had 164 lawsuits. Uh, these are just COVID-related election lawsuits, 164 lawsuits in 41 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure on um, uh, states and localities to change rules. And some of it's coming through these court cases and the courts are dividing and it's certainly the plaintiffs are not always successful, but this litigation is causing change. So I think as of yesterday, yesterday there were seven states that were not allowing anyone who wants to to vote by mail in November. I think now we're down to six because um, uh, Alabama has now said that they will count this as a disability. But so this has become a, you know, a state by state fight. And one of the things uh, uh, that we see is that uh, you know, the fights are over you know, very specific rules. So Alabama yesterday said, okay, you can vote without an excuse uh, uh, if you're afraid of getting uh, COVID-19, but you need a notary or two witness signatures uh, in order to vote. And you need to provide a photocopy of your voter identification card. I mean, these are things that are going to deter people from voting in the midst of a pandemic, and they don't serve any real anti-fraud purpose. So uh, Jake's absolutely right that, you know, we've got kind of this um, uh, decentralized, fragmented, voter-unfriendly system across lots of the United States. But some of that is coming under pressure now because of the virus to try to uh, force some change through litigation. Uh, and it's, I'd say, uh, partially successful. And Rick, you can tell Rick's the law professor. Um, but uh, I just want to, like, I do think there's this thing with the decentralization of election administration that teaches us. So the question is not, aren't you glad to have a decentralized federalist system now that you have a very dangerous executive branch at the national level? That's a common question I get. But if you think about the the ability of states to suppress votes, uh, to uh, administer elections poorly, to underinvest, um, among that, to gerrymander, um, when a party takes control of a state, it actually plays a role in creating the sort of politics of today, of Trumpism, of sort of plutocratic populism and all this. So we should think longer term about the incentives that federalism provides that, that lead to, I think, really poor election administration in the U.S. In addition, like, they, they, uh, are a lens through which all the forces of long-term institutional racism and plutocracy and things get filtered in a powerful way. Thank you all very much. This was extremely illuminating. I see at least sort of two issues uh, that came out of the last discussion. And one is sort of uh, relates to what Rick was talking about, the level of competence, the level of competence varying hugely. And it ties in with what Amel highlighted as about sort of the second order types of problems of the systemic biases. And so one sort of question is simply um, the types of errors, the types of sort of uh, efforts that signature matching, matching that are likely to be highly problematic, level of competence overall, to what extent do these sort of map on to existing systematic biases in terms of who's in franchise and who's not. And the other issue goes, to, goes back to Rick's nightmare scenario on the point of democratic legitimacy. Are there any institutions that are trustworthy enough by all sides to be a neutral arbiter to adjudicate the disputes, especially the national level disputes that arise from these scenarios. And uh, one sort of, uh, one institution that was referenced was the Supreme Court. One of the problems with going through the courts, it seems that it's not just a huge drain of time and resources, but it's very impenetrable to popular audiences. Um, the reasoning is very impenetrable or can be very impenetrable. So the, the basic question for, for all of you is, are there any institutions that can do this work and what uh, can we do to sort of lay the groundwork right now for trying to do the work of making the outcome seem legitimate, if it is actually legitimate? Well, so one thing I would say is, uh, if you go back to 2000 uh, and the disputed election in Florida between Bush and Gore, uh, the Supreme Court was successfully able to end that election. De Democrats were very unhappy. They grumbled, but... Uh, Power was transferred. Uh, we had a new president. Uh, he was uh, accepted as legitimate, I think, after 9-11 and, you know, kind of changed the, the tone uh, in, uh, of his presidency. Uh, but when that happened, uh, 
uh, even though the court divided five to four, it's important to remember that two of the four justices who were in the dissent were Republican appointed justices, David Souter and John Paul Stevens. Today, the Supreme Court is similarly divided five to four along ideological lines, but it's also divided along party lines with five of the conservative judges, justices appointed by uh, Republican presidents and the four liberal justices appointed by Democratic presidents. And so far, there have been four election related uh, emergency petitions that have made it to the United States Supreme Court this election season. And uh, in three of the four, the court divided along those lines. Um, and uh, the, the, the Wisconsin case that Jake made reference to earlier, uh, but also a case from Alabama, from Texas, and from Florida. Florida, not a pandemic-related case, but one about felon disenfranchisement. Um, I don't think that the Supreme Court would be seen as the same kind of neutral arbiter uh, that it uh, was by much of the public, certainly not all, there was a, a lot of democratic discontent, but by much of the public. Uh, and and I, I'd say the very opacity of the Supreme Court is its virtue in terms, you know, it speaks like an oracle and people, you know, well, they've studied this and this is what the law requires. Uh, I think that that kind of um, uh, gloss on the court uh, has diminished and you, overall levels of legitimacy of the Supreme Court. If you look at uh, polling, it's much more uh, partisan uh, divided uh, among the public. And so it's hard for me to see the Supreme Court serving as this uh, neutral arbiter. Uh, one of the things we suggested, I, I put together after we uh, had our uh, conference in late February, Can American Democracy Survive the 2020 Elections? I put together a committee of uh, bipartisan experts in law, politics, media, uh, and tech. And we issued a report called Fair Elections During a Crisis, which you can Google and find. And one of the things we recommended in there was the convening of bipartisan elder statespeople who could come together and try and speak about these issues. And, you know, I don't know how much that would sway the most ardent partisans, uh, but we are seeing people like Tom Ridge and Jennifer Granholm come together on the importance of vote by mail. And so I think, you know, trying to get um, former uh, presidents, uh, former secretaries of state. Uh, I think it's the best we can do, although I'm not at all confident that it would, um, for 20, 30 percent of the population, would be uh, a good enough way to try to, you know, establish a, a neutral body that could uh, speak on issues of election legitimacy. I agree with um, a lot of these points, and I think of the institutions that uh, we see around us, the Supreme Court is probably going to have the most credibility on these issues. But I also agree, not just the opacity, but I think legal logic is not always intuitive. Um, and so we saw that in the Wisconsin case where the courts overturned the governor's decision. I think, you know, the governor's decision was on shaky grounds legally, um, but it did not feel fair. It did not appear fair because it, it presented a different kind of logic than what people were expecting to see. Um, all that said, I still think the courts are probably where this is going to end up and where it's going to be decided. And I think at the end of the day, it's not institutions that I'm going to have the greatest faith in. Um, it's going to come down to leadership. And I think it's going to require leadership that is willing to, you know, fight hard to get the outcomes they want, but at the end of the day, accept a legitimate democratic outcome that has been determined. I guess I'll be the relatively more pessimistic one in this question where I think politics has really become, it's fascinating, but in a, the current sort of partisan and media landscape, politics at the mass level is so deeply uh, intertwined with cultural and racial resentment um, to the point where it's not really, it's not policy based, it's about, uh, it's a connection between sort of sociocultural forms of resentment and who's in power. Um, and there's a deep uh, uh, sort of affective polarization, a negative polarization against the other side. I do not see, so if you remember in 2016, like there were George W. Bush uh, declined the Trump endorsement. There's a number of sort of, uh, uh, you know, previous elder statesmen of the Republican Party that didn't seem to have a uh, very large effect on perceptions of, of sort of, I don't know, legitimacy of the other side and things like that. So not exactly sure. I hope, but I agree, this might be the best we have. But I think the alternate models we'll get to later, which are uh, uh, bolstering sort of the uh, democratic intervention of other organizational and mass level forces um, to, to uh, as a sort of countervailing power in elections.
Thank you so much. So one of the things that's come up a few times has been uh, about uh, basically sort of situating the current crises and the current questions within a longer history. And so we know that American democracy has always been uneven, to put it gently. Um, some of the vulnerabilities exposed in the last few years seem new, such as foreign interventions on social media or the increased role of anonymous actors in campaign finance. Others, such as voter suppression, seem to be sort of recurring problems. So I guess there's two ways that I want to take this question. One is simply to ask how com contemporary challenges compare uh, contemporary challenges compared to those of earlier years, what is specific to the current moment and what is endemic given our institutions and how this should shape our efforts uh, to respond. And then the other is to take it outside the American context. And so we'll come back to this next, but first like your thoughts on how it respond, uh, compares to later years. But I'd also like to know how these challenges compare to the problems faced by other countries, whether these are stable democracies and or regimes where a democracy is backsliding or has outright disintegrated. So let's start with the uh, American focus and then move it to a comparative perspective. And if, uh, start off with Jake, if we could. I'll jump in. Uh, so I think that's a great question. Some of the best, I think some of the best scholarship and sort of public intellectual thinking on what's going on now has drawn on the American case historically. So in light of the uh, Black Lives Matter movements about uh, reforming or abolishing police, uh, in light of voter suppression, in so many ways when we think about American democracy, people are drawing connections to American history. It's been extremely powerful. Um, I don't think we're back to the level of, of sort of uh, uh, semi-democracy, hair invoke democracy, authoritarianism that we had in the pre-65 period in uh, the U.S. South and really throughout, you know, uh, less directly throughout the entire country. Um, but the trends are very similar. So now, like, if you look at a state like North Carolina, it's really been fascinating where you see emerging in the states because states administer elections and do policing. And so they're on the front lines of determining how healthy American democracy is. Looking at a state like North Carolina is fascinating where in the 90s and 2000s, so first in the 60s and 70s, it was one of the hardest racially authoritarian enclaves to break through. To, it was the most, one of the most Jim Crow-ish states, a true non-democracy within a broader semi-democracy, the U.S. It uh, broke through through long-term civil rights movements, legal cases, enforcement by the national government, all of this. By the 90s and 2000s, North Carolina was expanding early voting, same-day registration, absentee ballots. It had increased its voter turnout by like 10 percentage points on average. It was like a hopeful case implementing the Motor Voter Act, all of this, it was, a, it was a, and it was increasingly electorally competitive between the parties. When you got to the 2010 election and the GOP takeover in 2011, you saw a, uh, in the 2010 wave, you saw a radical new gerrymandering of the districts. You saw a uh, uh, voter ID law immediately after the uh, 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 Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act gets uh, dismantled by the Supreme Court. It's really a case of democratic backsliding in the states, um, and that is actually quite uh, you know, draws a very clear connection to the state's own history earlier on. I would just add, um, I think, to, to a part of David's question about now versus then. What's different now, we've had periods of intense polarization in the United States before. What's different now is that um, social media uh, and the internet has... Um, has changed the nature of um, American democracy where we no longer have reliable intermedi intermediaries. There's no longer a Walter Cronkite. No, not, everyone's not gathered around the TV at seven o'clock to find out what happened on the news of the world. Uh, instead, uh, it is um, uh, the, the rise of uh, what's been called cheap speech has uh, caused a uh, a collapse of the model for local journalism. It has uh, allowed people who have um, non-fact-based conspiracy theories to find each other and to reinforce each other's beliefs. Uh, it creates these uh, uh, echo chambers, information silos, and all of this, I think, contributes to an atmosphere where uh, when the president makes a comment, for example, about um, 
fraud in elections, uh, it gets amplified. He can speak directly to tens of millions of people, and his message can be amplified and, and followed in a way that it wouldn't have happened if, you know, the what question was whether or not the political editor at the CBS Evening News was going to put this on TV. Uh, so, you know, we've had, Donald Trump is not the first American demagogue by far, but he is able to uh, sent his messages out in a, in a different way. And so I think that changes the nature of political struggle right now in the United States. No. So I would add to that, um, in thinking of what in my mind stands out as being very different now uh, is the steady weakening of parties in terms of their ability to manage the, nam the nomination process uh, and forge broad coalitions that can carry them through elections. And so I think in my mind that is actually linked to voter suppression. And I think, um, you know, we think of voting rights often in very negative terms, which is, to not, which is to say it's a negative freedom. You want freedom from discrimination and freedom from obstruction and, and intimidation and all those things are vitally important, of course. But we also know that in modern mass participatory democracies, mobilization, uh, I'm sorry, participation is a function of mobilization. And so many of the institutions that historically have played a role mobilizing voters across the board are atrophying. I'm talking labor unions, uh, even religious establishments no longer play the same role in, in, in civil society that they used to, which means that increasingly parties are doing this. Parties entirely are, are the, the vehicle for mobilization and more so campaigns are the vehicle for mobilization. Um, this means narrower and narrower coalitions as campaigns focus increasingly on their base. And it really, in my mind, is a different kind of voter suppression that's practiced by both parties by ignoring the, the hard to get voters that would require greater persuasion. It's weakening the parties even while it's bolstering them electorally. I just want to continue on Amel's absolutely wonderful answer there that I think bridges the sort of Rick brought a sort of mass level rise of social media and other forms of media and Amel sort of bringing the elite institutions in in connecting this the decline of the of uh, labor unions as an intermediary organization and so forth. Um, I, I do think at the elite level sort of the national coordination of the parties within this federal institutional structure really matters. So now if you're a Republican, no matter what office you're running for or what state you're in, if you have that, you know, mostly white district, you're probably going to win your Republican office. And the way to mobilize them is not to talk about, you don't have a different electorate than whoever's running for Senate or the U.S. president on the Republican ticket. You have the same line of voters um, in this polarized era. And therefore, you have the same incentives to shape the electorate as the other politicians do at the different levels of office. You have an incentive to dismantle labor unions who mobilize for the other team, whether you're uh, running for city council or you're running for state legislature or U.S. Senate or president and whatnot. Um, this creates a new set of incentives for coordinating and really investment by well-resourced political organizations plus elite strategy since the Southern strategy, for example, I've played a role in this, but there are real coordinating institutions in American politics now. Fox News uh, on the media side, the rise of, you know, sort of uh, large benefactors like the Koch Brothers Network. Um, and uh, all of these are sort of glue that hold the parties together in this very decentralized structure and, and help incentivize, along with Amel's point of the decline of the labor movement, help to incentivize a sort of cultural identity politics we see now where, you know, the Republican, mass level Republican uh, voting is based on cultural and white identity politics. At the elite level, it's about policy for uh, uh, major businesses and plutocratic interests. This is sort of the plutocratic populism in the new Hacker and Pearson book. Um, and then as well, the decline of the labor movement, my work shows has really helped uh, uh, create fertile ground for white resentment politics when you don't have a countervailing uh, political orientation around, for example, your workplace um, and an interracial uh, sort of form of collective action at work. Thank you all very much. So I'm hearing, uh, I think that these were wonderful points and a number of them sort of connect to each other through the weakening and bolstering of parties, the rise of social media and the decline of trust intermediaries, nationalization and hobbyism in elections, the polarization of parties, all of these seem to point to a sort of declining sense of trust in the process. And it's the trust in the process that underpins acceptance of the outcomes. And so that 
raises, this goes back to uh, what I'd wanted to bring us to, uh, which was how America's contemporary challenges compare to the problems faced by other countries, whether stable democracies or regimes where the outcome has been outright disintegration of democracy or a much more complex rise of uh, undemocratic but competitive forms of authoritarian rule. So how does America's contemporary challenges compare to these other places? I'd like to start off with a map. So thank you for the uh, question. I think, uh, you know, the comparative perspective cuts in two ways. Uh, what we can potentially generalize from the comparative perspective is what we know is one of the uh, essential features of, of our study of democracy, which is that uh, one of the strongest predictors of whether a democracy will endure is how long it has endured. Um, and so I think democracy produces its own self-enforcing mechanism. So on the one hand, we can say, you know, democracy in America is, is in somewhat secure footing in that respect. Uh, you can only take that so far. So this is not to say that democracy in America cannot fail, but I think if it does, it will look very different than what it, where it looks elsewhere. Um, and I think that's really the limitations in my mind of the comparative perspective, which is that we don't have any example of a centuries old democracy failing. We don't know what that looks like. And I think there's been a lot of really important work on uh, democratic backsliding in the United States. And, you know, I've uh, taken that all in. What uh, worries me is that much of the focus of those works is on the executive. Um, and there is a temptation, for example, to compare to an Erdogan or Orban or Bolsonaro, uh, when in reality, we're in a very different situation here, thankfully, in a very different situation, in part as a result of the, the age of the democracy and the institutional structure. So the first thing I would say is, you know, those other leaders were able to steamroll over legislatures and, and really make short order of, of what they wanted to accomplish in a way that I could not imagine happening in the United States, given um, institutions that, you know, appear to us to be weak, but relatively speaking, are really quite strong and able to resist autocratic tendencies effectively. Um, the other part, and Jake's already brought this up, is that much of American democracy resides in the states. So there's a lot of tendency to really focus on, on the state level, but I think we would, I'm sorry, on the national level, I think we would be well served to focus much more on the state level and focus much more on voting rights. This is something that Jake's talked about, Rick also has talked about, and I'm uh, fully with them on that. If we are really interested in the question of democratic backsliding, then we need to pay attention to what's happening to voting rights in the states. Thank you very much. Jake, would you like to respond to this question? Uh, it looks like Rick's ready. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I know I was just unmuting to say that I'm going to have to defer to the comparativists. Uh, you know, uh, I, I can say, you know, reading uh, uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt uh, yeah. and, and seeing the kind of the lists of what makes you move towards authoritarianism, uh, you know, we're checking off more things every day. And I would just say in the last few weeks, the, or even the last week, the, the sending of a, um, a federal police uh, to Portland is a very disturbing sign um, and lines up with some of the things we've seen uh, in you know, other countries where there's been this kind of democratic backsliding. Uh, but I really have to defer to the comparative. Yeah, so as do I, but I'll, as you know, I'll stick my neck out regardless. But uh, the Levitsky and Ziblatt, I'm a huge fan of How Democracies Die, that the book, um, which points to things like elite polarization, um, and, uh, but I, one, I think wrinkle in the polarization, I've more recently come to think about, okay, so what is it really about polarization at the elite level that is threatening democracy? And in my sort of ongoing work right now, I'm noticing that in recent years, democratic backsliding in the States is not well predicted by partisan competition, levels of partisan competition, not even really by elite polarization in state legislatures based on, you know, measures of their roll call votes and things like that. Rather, it's, there is something unique about the historical configuration right now of the Republican coalition and its policy demands. So it's really important that it does have both at the mass level and the elite level incentives to push back on democracy. And they're historically derived based on its white electoral base, um, which uh, wants to resist uh, voting by the young and uh, non-white people and things like that, um, and a legacy of sort of, uh, of, of essentially, you know, ethno-nationalism has been associated with limited democracy around the world. Um, 
In addition, at the elite level, you have clear economic incentives uh, to push back. You've seen uh, the Republican Party's national all the way down policy agenda has really been, despite the sort of discussion of the white working class at the mass level in the Trump base and things like that, it's really been to cut taxes on high income and high wealth individuals. That is like the raison d'etre of this party at the elite level. It's very clear. Both of those have clear, if you want those policies to go through, red meat in sort of white identity politics, or you want tax cuts on the wealthy, both of those point you to incentives to push back on democracy. So it's not necessarily polarization writ large, right? That just elites are really disagreeing with each other and have different ideologies. It's the particular ideologies that are happening now due to the geographic configuration. And I'll note that around the world, it's actually somewhat rare that you get the sort of tax cut on the wealthy party to be in a coalition with the sort of populist uh, majority ethno-nationalist group, right? Often you get that a, a classic fascism has a sort of uh, more uh, more redistrib economic redistribution along with sort of racial authoritarianism. But in the U.S., you have this unique configuration of, of anti-redistribution with sort of uh, ethno-nationalist mass politics, which seems pretty, pretty damn scary. David, I wanted to just add uh, one thing quickly, uh, which is that I, I didn't mean to suggest that I have no concerns about what's happening to the executive by any means. Uh, we have a leader who seems to kind of instinctively reach for autocratic measures instinctively and consistently. So that's certainly something to, to be worried about. Um, I think I would just warn against, there's a temptation to draw analogies to leaders in other places that may not be um, the, the most appropriate, but there's also the bigger danger of missing the real erosion to American democracy that has been happening and that in many ways allowed for 2016. So I think on both ends, um, I'm interested in making sure that if this immediate uh, challenge is removed, that we don't just, um, that we're not just satisfied with that outcome and say, well, we've rescued democracy and, and we're done here. I think the comparative perspective is extremely valuable. And one of the things that Amel touched on that I thought was very uh, useful um, was how whatever the danger looks like in the United States, it's gonna be filtered through the specifics of America's uh, institutions, in its particular history and so on. And so one of the great examples of this is it's electoral fragmentation. Uh, it's terrible if you're in it and it creates an extraordinary um, mess as Rick has identified in a variety of ways. Um, it does at the very least uh, potentially make one particular danger of Trump canceling the elections outright less likely, it would seem. Uh, although that would be a question for you. For you all. Uh, and then, so many of our, many of our audience might not be familiar with a book that uh, Jake referenced. It was uh, that both Jake and Rick referenced the Levitsky and Ziblatt book, uh, How Democracies Die. And one of the arguments in this book that I should sort of bring to the attention of the audience is that one of the things that they find especially important is the role of conservative elites and conservative parties in restraining uh, demagogues from accessing the system and then doing something, if they have access to the system in some way, doing something to make sure that they aren't able to gain power. So this brings us to a question that Rick has raised, as well as a question that was submitted in the audience. And uh, so I think we're gonna start turning now to the questions from the audience. And I should just say at the outset that a lot of you have submitted questions upon registration, so we have a lot more questions than we could possibly deal with. Others, have, uh, great questions have come up during the last half hour. We're not going to get to all, but we try to identify some of the most common questions and some of the most important ones that fit with the conversation. So the specific question goes back to something that Rick had discussed earlier, and that was what kinds of discourse, if any, might help shore up the legitimation of election outcomes during the error-filled, days-long period of vote counting after Tuesday? In particular, what might be the role of conservative elites, who have, those conservative elites who have broken with Trump, or who potentially haven't broken with Trump, but or might be breaking with Trump curious? <laughs> What role might they have uh, in those potentially panic-filled days? Rick, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's a role for everyone in terms of assuring election legitimacy. And in our report, Fair Elections During a Crisis, we, we say, you know, the media has a very big role to play 
uh, for example, in educating the public that uh, because of the shift to absentee ballots, uh, election results are going to be delayed, and delayed results do not mean that there is a um, something nefarious going on with the vote counting. Uh, and election administrators need to be transparent. They need to explain, here's what, how many ballots are left, here's when we're counting them, here's how you can observe them, here's when we expect results. Uh, but uh, absolutely, I agree that some of this depends on conservative elites. And, and in part, this uh, goes back to the, the very basic point I made uh, at the beginning, which is that much of the question about how successful the 2020 election is going to be is going to depend upon the margin of victory. If it's very close, then I do not expect that you're going to see conservative elites uh, lining up against Trump. Uh, you know, if you, you know, if you ask, you know, why, is, why isn't uh, Mitch McConnell or, you know, other uh, conservatives uh, who are in power, why aren't they speaking up? It's because uh, as the Republican Party base has changed, uh, Trump is much more popular than they are. And they know that if they go against the president, they will face a Trumpist uh, challenge from the right in a primary, in a partisan primary, and, and they would be uh, out of power. So um, uh, if it's not close, uh, then I think, and it may not be, you know, if the polls continue the way they are, and we have no way of knowing that they will, but if they continue the way they are and we get into past, past Labor Day and Trump looks like he's going down, then I expect you're going to see a lot more Republicans stepping out. And, uh, you know, we have an example of this, you know, think about thinking comparatively in states. We had a Kentucky governor, uh, Matt uh, Blevins, who was um, running for re-election and, uh, uh, on election night, it looked like he was losing to Andy Bashir, uh, who was the Democratic candidate. And um, you had Be uh, Blevins make the claim that he was um, subject to uh, fraud in, in the election. And he suggested that the Kentucky legislature, which is also Republican, uh, use a power it had to basically take the vote away from the people and declare him the winner. And, uh, you know, there was a couple of days of trial balloons of looking at that. Uh, the, that governor was not very popular. He could not come up with any evidence to support his uh, claims of fraud. He later claimed he was concerned about the, quote, urban vote, which I think was just a, you know, a nice way of saying that uh, African-Americans did not support his candidacy uh, in the larger cities. Uh, and uh, eventually the Republican leaders in that legislature told him, come up with some good evidence or step aside. And that's what he did. And we had a peaceful transition of power in Kentucky, which, you know, you wouldn't even think we'd have to talk about, but we're talking about it now. So I think if it's not particularly close, we'll see a lot of brave Republicans. If it is uh, very close, then, you know, you'll have the never Trumpers, you'll have the principled out of power. You know, now Paul Ryan's talking about Donald Trump in ways that he wouldn't when he was in power. But if you're talking about the Republicans in power, they're only going to speak up and, you know, say the truth about the election's legitimacy if it's not close. I, I think that's right. At the same time, I just, it's, I think it's important to highlight how limited that's been even for so even retiring Republicans in co the House and Senate, for example, have stuck with sort of Trumpism and the Trump coalition because now there is this large sort of backup industry for uh, conservative advocacy, um, sort of uh, grifting on, you know, conspiratorial uh, sort of fear of the other side, these sorts of things. So uh, it's limited and it's been quite so I've been a little surprised given the importance of conservative mainstream elites in determining, you know, whether the system, so to, the, to expand on David's point about Levitsky and Ziblatt, so it's conservative interests within electoral democracies typically don't want to redistribute more of their wealth and power to the masses as the electorate expands and the franchise expands and more people have a voice in uh, as democracy expands. Um, so they have an incentive to sort of constrained democracy in some ways, and they may pull the emergency switch and pop and partner and join a coalition with uh, demagogues if they feel that they're uh, too backed against the wall or for whatever reason. So I just think we are much closer to that where you see, I, I think it's much more typical to see the Susan Collins style, I'm very concerned rather than the uh, a slight, uh, slightly morally, more morally courageous uh, sort of uh, uh, putting one's own uh, popularity with the Trump coalition at risk. But let's hope, let's hope uh, this, you know, in the days before the election too, you may see some more elite Republican pushback to uh, delegitimizing statements from the Trump coalition. So I would add, um, you know, I do think 
if there's anything other than a landslide, we're going to see both parties really going to the mat. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't anticipate a complete blowout. I know we're in July and it's looking good for Biden, but, you know, 15 point lead in July is kind of like sinking a three point shot in pregame warm up. You know, so it feels really good, but I, I'm not going to count on it by any means. Um, I think back to the question of what do we do with the rhetoric and how do we take down the temperature? My mind really goes to the way both sides have framed this as really an existential threat. This election has become, uh, or the other side has poses an existential threat. And that's where you see the, the real danger, I think. And I think both parties have a responsibility in that respect. So yes, conservative parties play a certain role, but in my um, understanding of, of historical democracies and the failure of democracy more broadly and, and throughout Europe, both sides play a role, both democracies detractors and democracies defenders. Um, and often because they fear this existential threat and they fear that if they don't make a stand now that it's going to be all over. And so they overreact. So I think both sides have a responsibility to really bring down the temperature around this election and to focus on um, the acceptability of outcomes given the, the um, integrity of the process. Thank you very much. So the next audience question is going to be about foreign intervention, which is something that we haven't really touched on all that much in the conversation so far. So uh, there's a variety of ways that we could approach this. One is just how well equipped we are to fend off any sort of flipping of vote counts, what specific intrusions by uh, foreign uh, actors might be planned for the elections at, at present. Do we know what is sort of is coming? Um, and then ultimately, how important is it either in sort of changing vote outcomes or in changing how Americans understand the process itself. So I'd like to start off with Rick, if I could. So uh, what we saw in 2016 in terms of foreign interference, uh, if we look at what the Russian government did according to uh, the intelligence reports, um, they engaged in three different kinds of activities. Uh, one thing they did was they hacked into uh, emails of uh, Democratic officials and released those emails. That was probably the one that had the most impact on the election, you know, the Podesta emails and others, uh, demobilized the Sanders supporters, et cetera. Um, the second thing that was done uh, was probing of voter registration databases. This happened in all states. This did not cause a change in uh, any information. This report, maybe one or two states, there was an attempt to change a little bit of information, but it was enough to, I think, cast a cloud over things. And, and then the third thing that was done was, uh, and this got the most attention, but maybe had the least impact. The Russians spent about $100,000 on Facebook ads and other things to try to rile people up and, you know, famously organizing a rally of uh, a, a pro and anti-immigration rally on two corners in a Florida city. Um, we're already hearing reports of, you know, similar kinds of things happening uh, in terms of um, potentially releasing uh, information about uh, the Ukraine and Burisma and Hunter Biden uh, with stuff coming from the Russians. It was just a letter that was sent yesterday by Democratic leaders uh, uh, saying basically that Ron Johnson, the senator from Wisconsin's committee, was being used to launder this kind of information. And so we might uh, see that again. Uh, what, I do think that we're, in, in terms of our election machinery, we're much better prepared than we were before. Everyone is on the lookout for interference, uh, despite Trump and his unwillingness to recognize the Russian interference. Um, the Department of Homeland Security has been working with state and local governments on hardening voter registration databases and other things like that. Um, most states uh, and most counties have machines that produce a piece of paper which can be counted uh, in the event that there's an attempted hack of election software. So there's a paper record. That's not true everywhere, but it's true in more places now, and I hope that's the direction we're going to go. Uh, but, you know, we don't know exactly what foreign interference is going to look like. I'll mention two of my big concerns. Number one, false information that, is, um, uh, that, that relies on COVID uh, as a means of trying to deter voting, for example, uh, spreading information that polling places are closed or that you can vote by email, uh, you know, or things like that related to COVID. Uh, the other, and I described this scenario in some detail in, in my book, Election Meltdown, is a cyber attack on the electrical grid in a democratic city like Detroit in a swing state like Michigan. Uh, 
where I think that would really gum things up and uh, you know, people wouldn't be able to vote and there'd be a whole fight over what to do about it. And we don't have good rules about what to do about it. It's where our legal infrastructure is not up for the task of dealing with election catastrophes. Uh, and you know, I've called for states to try and deal with that for a long time and, and they really haven't. So there's plenty of room for foreign interference uh, in the election. Everyone's looking at the fighting the last war. I'm worried about the next one. And um, you know, if we had a president who was really strong against foreign interference and would say, you know, uh, messing with our elections would be treated like an act of war, I think that would be very helpful. But instead, we have a president who is inviting foreign interference in our elections, and I think that's very detrimental. No. So I think of the, all of the nightmare scenarios, this is the one that gives me the most pause because I think uh, aside from the technical defenses, which are really technical and rather political, there isn't a lot we can do. And I think this is an area where um, you can see a systematic bias in favor of, of one side or another. So this, this for me is one of the red flag items. Um, and I think, you know, Rick, rightly points that there are two different layers to this, the interference with the actual balloting, um, and then the manipulation of, of the electorate. And I think the latter is somewhere where we can uh, be more vigilant. A lot of the questions that have come in have been about what can we as citizens do? And this is an area where we can absolutely all be more vigilant and, and, and be more savvy about what comes through our social media outlets and our information bubbles. Um, and I think that's going to be one of our best defenses going into November. Sure. Um, yeah, the, I, my co-panelists are much more uh, high-level experts on this topic than me, but I'd say on the, on the sort of uh, the last point, the, uh, the sort of meme and public discourse intervention by Russia and things like that, if you remember, there was a prominent stories written about they targeted black Midwestern voters, if you remember, uh, who uh, to try to uh, get them less enthusiastic about the Democratic Party and Clinton as a candidate, uh, highlighting the legacy of tough on crime laws from the Democratic Party and the Clinton coalition and things like that. Uh, the memes had, you know, poorly spelled things and looked really bogus um, at the same time. So it's tough to know because uh, the U.S. abroad does so much uh, electioneering from the ideological level down to like actual uh, interventions physically um, that I, I don't know I tend to downplay like repeating like true facts about uh, tough on crime laws and things like that or uh, making voters less enthusiastic about the Democratic Party I'm not sure there's a real uh, national level response that can or should be done in the era of the internet about that. Um, and I do believe, I think Rick said that was probably the least influential of the foreign intervention strategies. Um, and I think that'll probably continue to be the case, but I just think we shouldn't necessarily, I don't know. I, I sometimes think we're a bit overly concerned about the, the memes. Perfect. Thank you. So another question that's come in is about, uh, so it, this goes back to sort of the earlier discussion about what institutions might be uh, effective for responding to an election day crisis or to an election, post-election crisis. And we talked then about the Supreme Court and one um, member of the audience is asking about um, uh, whether or not the results might be close enough and what would happen, what would be the perception of legitimacy if the, if the uh, election were to be decided by the House of Representatives. And we're thinking here about at least two aspects. One, what could the House of Representatives do? Um, what would that look like uh, if it were to be the ones to decide on the outcome of the election? And how legitimate or illegitimate would that be perceived as? Anybody wants to take a shot at that? I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on the Electoral Count Act, but there's a federal statute that was passed after a disputed election in 1876 that provides for rules about how to resolve counts. The Constitution also provides certain rules. Under one scenario, uh, the House of Representatives would decide with each state getting a vote as opposed to each member of the House, which would have a Republican bias today, given the, the, the way that the uh, House is uh, constructed. Um, this debate occurred back in 2000 between Bush and Gore, where some said that the Supreme Court shouldn't have resolved those disputes. It should have gone to the, um, to, to the Congress to decide. Um, 
Uh, you know, I get, I'd say the, one of the most common questions I get is, you know, what if Trump won't leave office? Well, you know, is, uh, you know is, is the Congress going to do something about that? And I would just point out that by operation of law and the Constitution, if, if no president has been chosen by January 20th, because there's still a dispute, then we go to the order of succession. And there's a question about whether that order of succession is constitutional, but the president is no longer the president then. So delaying the election or canceling the election does not seem to be a, a way forward. Much, much, if you're talking about nightmare scenarios that are much more within the realm of what's constitutionally allowed, it would be state legislatures reclaiming their right to choose presidential electors directly and sending those slates to Congress and, and canceling the vote, you know, taking the vote away from the people. I think that would provoke a rioting in the streets and, and should provoke rioting in the streets because that would be a profoundly anti-democratic move, even though it's actually allowed by the U.S. Constitution. I thought we were going to end on a happy note, but uh, <laughs> I'll leave that to the others. I was going to just comment that if you don't want to sleep between now and November, you should talk to election lawyers because they know more than anyone how many ways this can go sideways. And Rick, we're so um, indebted to you and, and the work that you all do to uh, keep track of, of, of these different considerations. Yeah. So while I don't think there's some sort of institution that's, uh, you know, so still so bipartisan and respected that it could single-handedly, you know, in many of these uh, in many cases of democratic backsliding, the military has the ultimate sort of decision and the military is still generally bipartisan respect or at least respected by bipartisan majorities. Um, at the same time, there are, is the mobilization of federal sort of, you know, military as policing troops in ways that are pretty correspond pretty well to other international instances of declines into fascism where you have certain uh, sort of partisan wings of, of uh, uh, the military and things like that. Um, at the same time, there are so many hopeful examples of democratic resurgence in the US from the Black Lives Matter uh, uprisings to a resurgent sort of uh, uh, wave of uh, labor actions, both of essential workers and, uh, and more. Um, this is, uh, all actually been crucial and I think does have a hopeful story to end on that when we think about uh, politics, uh, actually getting out and about, despite COVID, getting out and about into the streets actually seems to have had uh, some effect and may have an effect if uh, a real election meltdown, to quote the Rick's book, um, I do want to end on a, on a somewhat hopeful note. Um, so I guess the question I was going to ask at the very end was just quickly, what concrete steps uh, you, each of you would like to identify that we can take to revitalize American democracy, both preserving uh, the current elections, the upcoming elections, but also going forward? What would you think is the most important thing we could do? And I'll start off with Amel. Uh, so I fear that my answer will not be concrete enough. There isn't, you know, I think, for me, the most important thing is expanding beyond our understanding of electoral democracy. And so I will you know, echo what Jake just said. We are very focused on the regime challenge in the United States from the right. But there's a different kind of regime challenge happening on the left. And I think a, a great kind of regime challenge that is really questioning how we understand democracy and inclusion and participation in that democracy. Um, and really, my money is on that uh, as a vehicle for progress and, and improvement. I would add that people are very energized right now. Um, I think that uh, the 2016 election was a wake-up call for a lot of people about the fragility of American institutions. And um, uh, people are, you know, st stuff, is not, stuff is not sliding by without protest. And the fact that um, the inequalities that have been uh, building in our system over the last 20 to 30 years uh, are, are going noticed uh, is a hopeful sign because it does mean that, um, uh, you know, if there is a slide towards authoritarianism, at least people are not going down without a fight. And so, you know, uh, that does give me some hope, not necessarily in the very short run, but in the medium run that um, demographically there is a strong uh, sense of, uh, at least among a majority of Americans, of a need for a more inclusive and particip participatory democracy going forward.
There's a tremendous amount that's very like 1932 in ways, uh, multiple financial crises. We have a, a young, more diverse, uh, more immigrant-based generation coming of political age. Um, there are people taking action in the streets. I would call on civil society organizations like uh, universities, non-Republican aligned firms, for example, in the tech industry and elsewhere, um, the Democratic Party itself, labor unions, uh, uh, incumbent politicians at state and local levels to take uh, to think about policy feedbacks, uh, things that would encourage greater civil society participation as a backstop to democratic backsliding um, and, uh, and support that even when it puts you as an incumbent at the state or local level or as a university potentially at some short-term risk of, some, of uh, being primaried or some sort of chaos on campus with student activists or something like that, be brave. Be brave is marching orders for all of us. Uh, so I just want to thank all of you. This has been a very informative conversation. In closing, we would like to thank Cornell University and particularly the Anaudi Center for their generous support of Democracy 2020 series. Next section, session in the series will be in late August on the theme of already authoritarian, policing the use of force and democracies. Must be brave. Uh, the session will include Veshla Weaver and Sabrina Karim, and it's sure to be informative. So before we go, we want to thank you all again so much for joining us. And thanks also to our audience for some wonderful questions. It's been extremely enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you all. Thanks all.